even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, never let go through the calm and through the storm. light that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you here on the earth and I will fear no evil for my God is with me and if my God is with me. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, never let go. Every high and every low. Oh no, never let go, Lord. You never let go. the heart that holds on there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes still I will praise you still I will praise you yes I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes still I will praise Coming through the storm, oh no, you never let go. With every high and every low, oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. You keep on running, but you never let go. Singing, oh no, you never let go. Through the calm and through the storm, oh no, you never let. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord, we pray the Spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of its children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They've gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt." The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is a portion of Psalm 105. Let us read it together. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham his servant, O children of Jacob his chosen. Then he called for a famine in the land and destroyed the supply of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in fetters, his neck they put in an iron collar. Until his prediction came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He set him as a master over his household, as a ruler over all his possessions, to instruct his princes according to his will and to teach his elders wisdom. Hallelujah. A reading from Paul's letters to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. 
Or what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus walking on the water, or the idea of walking on water in general, is, is sort of a cliché in our vocabulary. If I say that my sister thinks that her new boyfriend walks on water, I'm just saying that she thinks he can do no wrong, and I'm probably kind of subtly indicating that I don't necessarily agree. In movies or TV or commercials, if we see someone walking on water, it's sort of the ultimate magic trick of the guru or the holy man or the magician. Walking on water is, is the one thing that cannot be faked. This is one of those readings where we go come to it thinking we already know what it means. And I'm always suspicious when we come to a reading thinking we already know what it means. If we already knew what it meant, why would we bother reading it? If we already know what it means, we've closed our minds and our hearts and our souls to learning anything more from it. When we come to one of these stories that we all know, it's worth asking, where did the story come from? Where are we reading it? Well, Matthew, Mark, and John each have versions of this story. Luke doesn't. And the three that do tell this story all agree on the first part. They agree about the disciples setting out on the boat, Jesus staying behind, and the disciples struggling against an opposing wind, and finally Jesus walking toward them across the water. Only Peter includes, I'm sorry, only Matthew includes the second part about Peter going out into the water himself. Only Matthew includes Peter's experiment with walking on water. Why? I don't know. Is Matthew trying to make Peter look foolish? Maybe. There are certainly a lot of stories in the Gospel where Peter is the impetuous, foolish one who acts before he thinks and speaks without reflection. 
In any case, somebody thought that this part of the story was important, that it added something. Now, just to be clear, Matthew and Mark and Luke all tell stories about Jesus calming the storm, but that's a different story. In that story, Jesus is in the boat with the disciples asleep in the back, and the storm comes, and they're in danger of being swamped, and Jesus wakes up and calms the storm. This is a different story. This is not a storm. This is just an opposing wind making life difficult for the apostles. With a story like this, it's worth looking at what comes just before and just after this story. This immediately follows the story we read last week about the feeding of 5,000, 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Jesus has just given this remarkable sign of the kingdom of God. And after this story, Jesus and the disciples proceed to the other side of the lake where he performs miraculous healings in a foreign land. We're sort of in an in-between spot here, between miracles, between Galilee and Syria, a completely in-between, undefined place in the middle of the lake. With stories where we think we already know, it's worth looking at what the story actually says, not what we remember it saying. Jesus dismisses the crowds and sends the disciples on ahead while he goes to a mountaintop to pray, something he seems to do frequently in the Gospels. It's already late. It's after dinner. They've spent a lot of time and energy wrangling crowds and ultimately passing out bread and fish to feed 5,000. And now they have been working all night long in the boat. It's not clear whether they are rowing or whether they're just sailing close to the wind, but in either case, it's a lot of work and they're exhausted. They're not really in any danger. This is, this is not a storm. There's no fear of them being swamped. They're just exhausted. They've been working against the wind all night long and not getting anywhere. And what is it that they actually see? A figure walking toward them across the water. We know it's Jesus, but they don't. They reasonably assume, if you see a figure walking across the water, they assume that it's something supernatural. Remember, they didn't have floodlights. They didn't have uh, any way. They were out in the middle of the night, in the middle of a lake, in near pitch blackness. And so, in their fear, Jesus immediately calms them. Take heart. It's I. Do not be afraid. I know this looks weird, me walking across the water. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Nothing to fear here. In Mark and John's version, Jesus gets into the boat and the wind calms down. And that's the end of the story. The disciples aren't afraid of the wind and the water. It's not about calming the storm. They're sailors and fishermen, after all. They're just afraid of this water ghost. And once the water ghost tells them that he's Jesus, they're fine. And this is where Mark and John end the story. But in Matthew's Gospel, Peter tries this little experiment. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Why is he doing this? Jesus has already said, it is I, do not be afraid. There's no reason to abandon ship and jump into the lake. Jesus is coming toward the boat to join them. Why is Peter testing Jesus? Is he showing off? Is he showing a lack of faith? Well, earlier in Matthew's Gospel, as we discussed last week, Satan tempts Jesus. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself off this high wall. Surely God will save you. Prove to me that you are the Son of God. Near the end of Matthew's Gospel, the high priest mocks Jesus, saying, If you are the Messiah, the Son of God, tell us now. And at the cross, the mockers at the foot of the cross say, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Prove to us that you are the Son of God, because right now you look like a sad victim. But that's not what Peter is asking. He doesn't say, Prove to me that you are the Son of God. He says, Lord, if it is you, Peter isn't asking Jesus to prove his divinity, like Satan, like the high priests, like the mockers. Peter is asking this ghost, this figure, in the dark, to prove that he really is Jesus. Now, Peter hasn't yet declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, in his, in his great confession. That comes 
few chapters later. We'll read that in two weeks. But Peter has already seen Jesus cast out demons. He's seen Peter, he's seen Jesus heal the sick. He's heard him preach good news to the poor. And just a few hours ago, he's seen him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Peter has no doubt of Jesus' power. He's just not sure that this guy is really Jesus. In the dark, in the middle of the lake, walking on the water. This is like the little tests we make to test someone's identity. If that's really you, tell me something that only you and I would know. Tell me your mother's maiden name. Tell me the name of your first pet. Tell me where we went on our first date. And not only is Peter testing to see if this is really Jesus, Peter is willing to put his own neck on the line for it. Peter is reasoning, okay, I know that Jesus can save me from death. If you're Jesus, prove it to me. Save my life. If you're not Jesus, I want to know right now, before we let you into our boat, before we trust you with all of our lives. So Peter steps out of the boat. He starts walking on the water toward Jesus, and after a few steps, he begins to sink. Now, are we supposed to think that this is where Peter's faith fails? That if he had true faith, he would not have sunk? Are we supposed to think that this is where he goes wrong when he reaches out to Jesus and says, Lord, save me? When he's trusting Jesus with his life, and when things look worse, calling on Jesus to help him? Yes, Jesus ribs Peter a little bit about this experiment. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But I've got to believe that this was said with a little chuckle. Most importantly, it was said as Jesus was hauling Peter up out of the water, saving his life, whether he doubted or not, whether his faith was strong or not. The other disciples in the boat finally catch on and, and worship Jesus more correctly and say, truly, you are the Son of God, to which it's hard not to respond no kidding, geniuses. But Peter doesn't say a word here. He doesn't have to. He's already said it all when he said, Lord, save me. When it's dark, when we're tired, when we're out at sea, far from shore, that's when we start seeing ghosts. We start seeing ghosts of fear that tell us to stay in the boat where it's safe, don't risk anything. We see ghosts of greed and panic that tell us that there will never be enough, that there's not enough room in the boat to invite anyone else in. We see ghosts of control that tell us that we have to get this right, that we have to do this ourselves, that we can't trust in anyone else. We all have our own ghosts. They're different for each of us, but they're the same for all of us. And we may be able to see through some of these ghosts, but some of them look pretty real. Some of them are actually pretty attractive and seductive. And most dangerously, some of them come dressed up as Jesus. But we know who Jesus is. We know that Jesus is the one who casts out demons. We know that Jesus is the one who heals the sick and proclaims good news to the poor. We know that Jesus is the one who feeds us and the world from his bounty. We know that ultimately Jesus is the one who saves us and saves all from death. Jesus is the one we trust with our lives. We don't have to wonder if Jesus is the Son of God. We already know that deep in our bones. But sometimes when we see a ghost walking towards us across the water, it's worth asking, Lord, is that you? Is that you, Lord, or is that a phantom of my own fear? Is that you, Lord, or am I just hearing the sound of my own voice bouncing back to me in the wind? Is that you, Lord, or is that the devil telling me exactly what I want to hear? Because if that's you, Lord, I know that you will save me from death. 
If that's you, Lord, I know that you will preserve my life. If that's you, Lord, I know that you will lift me up. If that's you, Lord, I know that I can trust you. And Lord, if that's you, I know that I can step out of this boat. Amen. I invite you to join with me in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Peter, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. I especially ask your prayers for our African-American brothers and sisters, that the recent demonstrations that have renewed and raised awareness of their mistreatment in our society may lead to some real change, and that we might all live out our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace and respect the dignity of every human being. I ask your prayers for those most affected by the coronavirus, those who have the disease, those who have lost jobs, those who have lost friends, and for those whose jobs are deemed essential, for those caring for the sick, and for those searching for a cure and a vaccine. I ask your prayers for those in our parish family who have requested them and whose names are in our newsletter and for others that you might know of. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. And in this week's cycle of prayer, I ask your prayers for our music ministry that makes our, on our worship services so fulfilling. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. 
By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the peace of Christ be always with you. Welcome to St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Coral Gables. I'm so glad that you chose to join us this Sunday morning or whenever it is that you are watching this video and participating with us. I hope that you'll continue to participate with us with activities all during the week, with uh, Bible study on Zoom on Wednesday nights, with women's groups and discussion groups and cooking classes and a, and a class in Celtic spirituality. All of these things can be found on our website and in Insta, our weekly email bulletin. If you are interested in uh, in signing up for InStep or have been taking part in any of our activities, please contact the church office uh, with the numbers and email below the video. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God. <laughs> with you 
and embrace you with all the love of my soul. Let nothing ever separate you from me. May I live in you, and may you live in me, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again you call us to live in the fullness of your love, and so this day we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. The supper was ending. Jesus took the cup of wine. Again he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gather at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come. We offer to you our gifts of bread and wine, and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ, and breathe your Spirit over the whole earth, making us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. And in the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Spirit of Truth lead you into all truth, giving you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to proclaim the wonderful works of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.